Hi, welcome to my show. I have as my guest today, Brett Felton. He has an incredible story. Um, he's uh, f originally from Michigan and he went and served um, during the war and then he, and he fought ISIS and he was interviewed by um, ABC. Was Correct. it Nightline? Yes. 60 Minutes. 60 Minutes. Um, so he has an amazing story. And then to top it all off, at such a young age, aside from having all these experiences, he's currently running for mayor for the city of Warren. Hey, Brett. Welcome to my show. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming. Um, well, as you know, I'm of Chaldean background, and so um, the video that I had the chance to watch was so touching. And um, because not only did you serve for the U.S. Army, but then you also decided to go back and serve some more um, when ISIS was invading um, the Christian villages in northern Iraq. Um, and so, please um, share with us that experience and why you decided to do that. Uh, uh, first off, I believe uh, going in the Army at 18, after 9-11, uh, I signed up with good intentions. Um, what had happened in Iraq was extremely disappointing. Uh, under Saddam versus without Saddam was completely different Iraq. And what we did is we kind of went in there and, and we broke the country without properly fixing it before we left. And that left a power vacuum. And because of that, uh, groups like Daesh and, and other uh, extremist groups decided uh, to attack the religious minorities in Nainawa, including uh, the, the Christians, the Yazidis, uh, and the other minority groups uh, in Iraq. And, and it was heartbreaking to me to see that, uh, especially with the Chaldeans and the Assyrians in Nainawa. Uh, they've been there for longer than anyone else, and yet their largest diaspora, the largest group of them, don't even live within their country. I didn't think that was right. Uh, I knew I wouldn't be able to make a big difference. Let's be honest here. Everything's political. Uh, it's all politics. But I figured I could raise awareness. I could provide training. I could provide supplies. As we've seen, uh, when we pull out of somewhere and, and we don't leave them with the proper security, a lot of things can happen. The U.S. and its allies will not always be there, and uh, I, I don't believe we can rely on Baghdad, nor do I believe we can rely on the Kurds for the security of our people, the Christians in the Middle East. Uh, they've been abandoned by the governments. Uh, they're left to fend for themselves. They've had weapons removed by the Kurds. There were towns under attack, such as Bakofa and Nainawa. Uh, we got a report Daesh was supposed to be coming in for an attack that night. And uh, the underarmed, uh, under-equipped Christians stayed while the Kurds, with their dual 51 Cal Dushka trucks, decided to drive off. So. They were there to defend themselves. And I think if we can get people there to train them, to help secure their lands, and to, to try to raise awareness in the need uh, for a government who will protect the people, I think that's, that's what's most important. Uh, and on a human rights scale, what's happened to them over there is atrocious. Their houses are ransacked, murdered, raped, uh, every worldly belonging they had left in their houses with less than 24 hours to take what they can carry and flee. So. Well, and um, the reason, I mean, this story, it's, uh, yes, a lot of people know about this story, but the courage that you had and the way that you stepped up to it, um, it kind of, so people can have an idea of the kind of courage that you have. Uh, and sometimes it gives an under, a better understanding of the person who is right now, you know, you're running for mayor. Um, but you have, although you, 
you're young, but you have a lot of experience <laughs> behind you. I, I would really like to show this video. I think it says so much about you because you seem pretty fearless <laughs> yeah, <laughs> based on yeah. what you said. Yeah. I, I watched the interview yeah. and I was really impressed um, by your faith um, and just by your responses and uh, and um, some of the amazing tattoos that you have as well. There's a <laughs> so, lot of them. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to play this video here. You're going to meet an American holy warrior, a U.S. Army veteran and a devout Christian who has made it his personal mission to fight ISIS in northern Iraq. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Terry Moran takes us now within sight of the infamous black flag of the Islamic State. heard of them, Americans and Europeans who become jihadis to fight for ISIS. The fighting has just begun. Now, meet a holy warrior on the other side, a U.S. Army veteran who's come back to Iraq on his own to fight against ISIS in the name of Jesus Christ. We traveled across northern Iraq to the front lines to meet him. So the next towns over are full of ISIS. Yes, and you'll, you'll How far see... Are they? How far? Uh, less than two kilometers, so about a mile. Brett, he asked that we don't use his last name to protect his family back home. He's 28 years old, Detroit, born and bred, and he's been here six months now, taking the fight to ISIS. Here we are sitting in the, in the cemetery outside the church in this town that is now your home. It's beautiful, isn't it? It is. It's a place I suppose you could die here. Yeah, and we might, but... It's, it's peaceful, it's nice. Are you prepared to die? Always. It's, it's nothing to be afraid of. Everyone dies. But I would rather die doing something for other people and serving God than sitting home. But why you? Why not me? You know, Jesus says, you know, what you do unto the least of them, you do unto me. And uh, I take that very seriously. I take that to heart. So Brett's mission to protect Iraqi Christians, Assyrians, Yazidis, Kurds, and other minorities here in the north of Iraq. ISIS hates them with a grotesque passion just in the past month, slaughtering Christians on a Libyan beach, abducting more than 200 Christians from a Syrian village. Do they attack much? Uh, yeah, we have positions. Uh, this area frequently gets mortared. So this is home now. Bakofa, a deserted Christian village overrun by ISIS last summer, taken back by Kurdish troops in November. Across the fields in the far distance, the black flag of ISIS flies on the water tower of the next town. Scenes captured in this video from Dwek Nausha, the militia Brett fights alongside. Safety off? Um, yeah, off now. Safety off and yeah. helmet on. We head up to the high position that Brett and the Kurdish Peshmerga soldiers used to scan the no-man's land. So this is a high position up here. Direct the scope uh, over to the water tower in that town. And on the top, you'll see flying very clearly huge black flags, which are ISIS flags. You see them? Yeah, I do. They're out there. That's our motivation every day. It's an ideal position, and the fighters here have used it to launch mortars at ISIS. And there's this rare glimpse, Brett's own video, of boots on the ground way up here in northern Iraq. Members of the U.S.-led coalition launch a Raven drone and then coordinate airstrikes or artillery fire on ISIS positions. Nice takeoff. It's going to be big impact. But the fight is far from over here, and this position remains precarious. How frequently does this place get mortared or shot at from this position over here? A couple here? times a week, yeah, religiously. And if the weather conditions are bad, more frequently. They like bad weather. They, they come love it. it. Yeah. It's a thief in the night. Yeah. You hear a lot of scripture woven into Brett's conversation. This is from the Bible, Psalm 23. He wears his faith on his sleeve, literally. And he wears, in addition to a Kurdish keffiyeh scarf, his American combat fatigues from his first tour in Iraq. 2006 and 7, in the infamous Triangle of Death, we talked about it in a town behind the front lines. Those were pretty intense years. Did, did you see a lot of combat? Oh, yeah. I've seen enough to last me a lifetime. Uh, I was blown up by IEDs. Uh, we were mortared. 
numerous times. You know, I had friends, I lost friends uh, taking headshots from snipers. Uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, I've had to take other people's lives. I mean, it's, it has a lasting impact, I would say. When he got home, he had troubles. A diagnosis of PTSD after suffering severe wounds in an IED attack and a job he didn't love. Then, Brett watched as ISIS swept across Iraq, inflicting tremendous suffering, especially on the Christian and Yazidi communities, and it clicked for him. This was his fight again. The business is open, uh, restaurants are open, uh, the church bells ring. And this is the victory then? This, this is the real victory. Above this town square, the Christian monastery, whose bells have rung for hundreds of years, even as it was besieged by invaders, an apparently endless cycle of violence. What do you say to Americans who say, we're done with Iraq? It's broken, they have to fix it, this isn't our war. I say shame on them, because I was here myself in 2006, 2007, uh, we have a responsibility to help rebuild what we broke. And Brett is not alone. He has already been joined by about a half dozen others, and he says they are just the tip of the spear. How many are there like you, Americans and others, Westerners, Christians, who are willing to come and fight with you? There's a lot. How many is uh, a lot? Right now, I mean, my inbox fills up every day hundreds H more hundreds hundreds many hundreds uh it's it's overwhelming but does iraq really need more foreign fighters fired by religious zeal isis says they're motivated by faith you say you're motivated by faith what's the difference they don't know god if they do if they did they would know that god would never command you to commit such atrocities they want to rule we don't want to rule. We want peace because we know that God rules. A holy war. And in this fight, a soldier of Christ, as Brett describes himself, must be the most hated man on the battlefield for the enemy who know of him and thirst for his blood. You've seen these videos, the beheadings, they burn people alive, the atrocities. Are you afraid that might happen to you if they caught you? No. Why not? Uh, it's real. It is, it's very real. But Jesus said, be faithful unto death, and I shall give you the crown of life. A soldier, a Christian, a man trying to walk the walk of his faith. So he has returned to the valley of death. For Nightline, I'm Terry Moran in Erbil, Iraq. Um, I think the, the reason I really wanted to show that is it says so much about you and the kind of service that you've already done, not only um, for your country, but for the minorities that have um, suffered under the, uh, you know, the atrocity of ISIS. Um, and now you're here in, in your hometown. And what are you, how are you gonna plan, um, serve your community? What are your plans for your community? Well, there's always a lot of ways to serve the community. There's, uh, as individuals uh, from religious groups uh, to the city. In regards to my running for mayor, uh, there's a couple things I would really like to do to focus on helping, helping the people. Uh, I believe the, the government works for the people, uh, not vice versa. And I, and I believe with the funds available and, and the problems we're facing, uh, the lack of, of, of a better education system, I think is something we need to address, but that's done at a much higher level than city. Uh, there's a couple things. As mayor, I want everyone to know, there's an open door policy. I, I think one of the best things you can do is give an ear uh, because everyone has a voice and people have concerns. And I believe that those concerns should be addressed now, obviously, not all of them you would be able to do something about, but I think it's important to hear what people have to say in regards uh, to their own community and to the way that their government operates. I would love to keep the last hour open of each day to meet with people from the community, come in, drink a chai, 
drink a coffee, <laughs> and let's talk about the issues, concerns, or even anything positive you see going on you would like to bring light to. Uh, another issue, something that would be a little closer to me and uh, the veterans would be, uh, we've been used as a political tool for too long. Mm -hmm. I've personally tried since 2011 to get uh, Jim Fouts, the current mayor, to open a commission board. It never went anywhere. Uh, I tried to, to have him reach out to some other people. No one wanted to hear it. No one cared. Uh, so I would like to start. And that would do what? What would the commission? It, the commission or there's other options such as a committee. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be a place such as the Disabilities Commission, which handles the affairs of individuals with uh, physical, cognitive disabilities, etc. Yes. This would be handling the affairs of the veterans within the city. No. Because you experienced firsthand, you know, you also suffered um, because of, of your participation as a vet Correct. As in the U.S. Army. So you Correct. know firsthand, you know, what that's like. I was previously on the Disabilities Commission, and uh, they, they really try. Good people. They, they honestly and sincerely have the best of intentions to help people. Mm -hmm. But it's always the bureaucracy that gets in the way of anything really being able to be done to help the people. I don't think it's got to be like this. Uh, I think it's it's shameful that they continue to use the veterans, uh, especially as uh, an a advocate for veterans in the city, uh, Purple Heart City. We have the memorials, we have the park, yet we they don't have a voice. So I, I want to give them a voice. Uh, something else I would like to do is in regards to community help, I would like to open programs. Uh, I believe the city has uh, multiple facilities and we also have great access to, to non-governmental facilities. Uh, we have funds uh, available. Uh, I believe that we could open up programs, uh, classes more or less, mm -hmm. what could be taught at the city because let's be realistic. How many people do you know today can afford to go to college? Every year, they're just, they're... Well, tuitions are keep going up. <laughs> drastically, <laughs> and they're pimping us. Yeah. And, and then the books go up. Yeah, that too. Most, <laughs> mo most people in Warren, they don't have $100,000, $80,000. So what do we have? We have individuals who want to work, people who really care and who want to be productive members of society, but they can't afford college. Well, here's a plan. A lot of the biggest companies and the most successful companies in the world don't require an education because education just shows that you can commit to something regardless of what your degree might be. But there are so many jobs available and uh, there's so much room for opportunity. Uh, you can open a class for coding you can open a class for programming, C++, Python, all these different programs. A lot of this stuff you can do from an actual work building or you can do from home. Mm -hmm. So that's another option. Like practical things, exactly. that, yes. And this is, this is stuff, technical writing, programming. This is stuff that, that pays good money. It, it pays very good money. And uh, I've known kids in high school who can earn over six figures because they go home from school and they can program on their computer and while everyone else is going off spending a hundred grand, they're pulling in 250 a year as a 19 year old. And it, it seems to me that the workplace is changing and, and if Warren doesn't evolve with the needs of the people, uh, we're gonna suffer because of it. We have so many people with so much great ability. Mm -hmm. But it has to be there. It has to be channeled correctly. We need to get them into programs into trades. There's another one, skilled mm -hmm. trades. I don't know why more people aren't involved in the skilled trades. I think we should be. I think the city could prop up a program, uh, work something out with the contractors. We could have a developmental center for the skilled trades. Skilled trades is phenomenal work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the blue collar work that built this country. Uh, and that's something I, I think that's not being addressed enough and that will do nothing but benefit the city. Now you got these skilled workers. Uh, we have a shortage 
of, of skilled trade workers. We're, we're exporting jobs overseas. If we have people who can do this here and keep it within the city, I feel that that would be a great benefit to the people. Uh, do you feel that some um, people are afraid of change? Because <laughs> I saw a, a <laughs> saying the other day about how the way our parents raised us is for the world that they were living in, but that world doesn't no longer exist. And sometimes it takes a while from generation to generation because right now what you're explaining with regards to school and stuff, I mean, I know my kids, what they're talented in is something I don't even understand. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, mean, I you know, yeah. when my son tries to, t and I'm like, yes, yes, you know, and I try to be supportive and trying to understand, but I really don't understand it, but I can see how easy it is. This is his type of communication and it's things that it's their world. Um, and I do see sometimes in um, areas that I'm involved in that there's a problem. Um, I don't know. Well, I guess it is a problem where there's a, a difficulty in embracing change. Maybe there's right. a fear or something like that. There is. There's there's a, there's a lot of hesitation when it comes to change because you're dealing with something you don't know or you just don't understand. Uh, and, and this is in every aspect of life. People right. are very hesitant to change. But then I'll ask you this. Growing up, 20 years ago, there was no Facebook. Correct. There, there was no Twitter, mm -hmm. no Instagram. Uh, we didn't have apps on phones. Mm -hmm. uh, everything I'm talking about requires excessive programming. Uh, so the, it is changing. The country's changing. The world's changing. The world is changing. And yeah. uh, everything's very different than it used to be. And I don't want to see our city become stagnant. I, I think we have a lot more to offer than just uh, vehicle manufacturing and engineering and stuff like that. Uh, I think we have a lot more to offer, and uh, I, I think we need, really need to address the issue uh, of unemployment, of underemployment, of a lack of uh, skill set to help provide better employment. Uh, and I think everything I've mentioned is, is feasible, and I think it's reasonable. And uh, I, I think uh, everything we're discussing could easily be pulled off with a little bit of work, uh, but I just don't see that work being done right now. Uh, mm. And I think that needs to change. I think we don't need another mayor in Warren. I think we need a leader. And uh, to, to become one of my favorite verses, uh, to become a leader, to, to do anything really, he who wants to be best must make himself last. So uh. to me, a, a mayor is an administrator. A leader is someone who's willing to sacrifice, to, to do what is right, uh, and to stand up and lead by example. And uh, that's what I think Warren needs, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I like that um, description. And as I mentioned, I think given what you've already lived through, you've proven that you are willing to go to whatever extreme to serve and for the betterment of, um, for the betterment of humankind and to bring this kind of peace into our world. Um, and, you know, it's always, I believe, I've, I've also, when I was younger, before I got married and had kids, I traveled the world and I tried and I picked, I learned so much from yeah, the yeah. other countries that I visited. Yeah. It was really wonderful. Um, and I felt that at times I, I thought that, you know, if I could just live here, I mean, Greece is so beautiful and Rome yeah, is so beautiful in the middle, you know, yeah. every country. And then I realized, but you know, this is home to me this is it home is. Is. and then how can I bring what I've learned from elsewhere and bring it home and to serve my community so I feel that your experiences your profound experiences you're now bringing that type of attitude and that kind of leadership in order at the end that's where all um, you know I think Mother Teresa's when they were awarding her and, she, and they asked her you know what ca what can we do what can we do to better the world, to do this and that. She said, you know what, go home and take care of uh, your families and your communities. Um, so really at the end, we take our experiences and we bring them home. And it, f it feels like that's what you're doing. Yeah, I've, I've, I've traveled the world. Uh, I've learned about hospitality uh, from the Middle East, mm -hmm. especially my peeps in Iraq. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've learned about love uh, from the time I spent in Africa. I, I learn about true worship and uh, not getting too involved in the world and, and what it has to offer. 
uh, because everything will pass. Uh, all the different places I've been to, I, I've learned something from each culture, and they're all beautiful in, in their own way. And Warren's very diverse. It's yes. extremely diverse. Yes. Uh, and I appreciate it. Unfortunately, not everyone likes it, but I appreciate it because I think that's what has made America great. That's is true. Is that we are a nation of people from a majority of us born here, correct? But at some point, everyone came from somewhere, and, and everyone has their own cultures and customs. Uh, and, and I really think that that's helped us to grow as a country. Mm. Uh, and I think it'll continue to serve us in the future. And uh, I think as long as, as, as we can love one another, then a lot of these problems we can overcome. But that's the most difficult part. Well, I agree that this country really, um, there's so much gifts in this country. And, you know, when you said about the open door policy, that's yeah. what the United States is about. You know, that, that, that dialogue that we don't have in the Middle East sometimes. <laughs> well, actually, a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, majority of the times, unfortunately. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, what, you know, I think you should write a book. I've heard about that from people all really, over the world. For your, for your young age to have this much of an experience, um, I think you should write a book. And uh, I, you know, and I look forward to you growing in, in your area uh, of wherever you end up doing. I think that regardless of where you're going tomorrow, you are a leader. You know, sometimes we don't, whether we get that t a title as mayor or uh, anything else, yeah. but as leaders, you always end up leading somehow or another. So wherever you are, I know that I will probably have you back somehow interviewing you about something great that you're doing. <laughs> I would hope so. Yes, I'm I sure. Really I'm so. sure you seem like a, a leader just by, by being. Um, and uh, and who knows? Maybe you'll have that book one day, and then we'll have you back <laughs> to talk about your book. Because I'll sign your copy. Okay, for you. <laughs> thank you. Because I think um, you it seems like you have a lot of wonderful things to share that you could share with the world. Um, so you know just a thought put it on your to-do list <laughs> yeah well, you know what yeah. there's so much to do and at, at one point that's probably something I would be interested in uh, because whatever anyone knows about me you just scratch the surface there's a lot more that goes on yes. and uh, uh, and that would be something that would be interesting in the future well I really look forward to it. I will be watching um, your growth. Uh, I'm, you know, it, it's exciting to see people uh, doing great things in the world. This is why, you know, when I created this show, because um, it's been about like a year and a half, and uh, what what was happening was there was so much. Um, everybody kind of knocking each other down and going at it, and then I thought, you know, how can we? Rather than me complain about what isn't out there, of all this negativity, all that noise, how can I create something that's different? And so creating this allows for a different story to come into the picture. And that seems like people like you, that's what you're doing. We need to focus on the people that are doing great things in the community. Um, I really thank you for all, for the service that you've done both here and in my birth country. I've been here almost four decades, but you know, we still have ties and those and the areas that you were in, those were my ancestors land, you know, that you were fighting for. So I really thank you. Um, I think that we, you know, we are blessed to have you. I thank you for coming on my show. I wish you the very best of luck. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. Okay. And uh, I, I believe together we start with building a better Warren. And then uh, every day we just continue to, to make our state and our country better. Yes. Improves upon ourselves each day. Yes. And uh, we'll get there eventually. Yes, God willing. God bless you. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much.